Chapters 10 through 12 of Space Viking by H. Beam Piper. Read by Mark Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Space Viking. 10. It took Valkenhayn and Spazzo more time and argument to convince their crews than Trask thought necessary. Harkeman seemed satisfied, and so was Baron Rathmore, the Ward's Haven politician. It's like talking a lot of uncommitted small landholders into taking somebody's livery and maintenance, the latter said. You can't use too much pressure. Make them think it's their own idea. There were meetings of both crews with heated arguments. Baron Rathmore made frequent speeches, while Lord Trask of Tanith and Admiral Harkeman, the titles were Rathmore's suggestion, remained loftily aloof. On both ships everybody owned everything in common, which meant that nobody owned anything. They had taken over Tanith on the same basis of diffused ownership, and nobody in either crew was quite stupid enough to think that they could do anything with the planet by themselves. By joining the Nemesis it appeared that they were getting something for nothing. In the end they voted to place themselves under the authority of Lord Trask and Admiral Harkeman. After all, Tanith would be a feudal lordship, and the three ships together a fleet. Admiral Harkeman's first act of authority was to order a general inspection of fleet units. He wasn't shocked by the condition of the two ships, but that was only because he had expected much worse. They were space-worthy, after all they had gotten here from Hoth under their own power. They were only combat-worthy if the combat weren't too severe. His original estimate that the Nemesis could have knocked both of them to pieces was, if anything, over-conservative. The engines were only in fair shape and the armament was bad. "'We aren't going to spend our time sitting here on Tanith,' he told the two captains. This planet is a raiding base, and raiding is the operative word, and we are not going to raid easy planets. A planet that can be raided with impunity isn't worth the time it takes getting to it. We are going to have to fight on every planet we hit, and I am not going to jeopardize the lives of the men under me, which includes your crews as well as mine, because of underpowered and underarmed ships." Spazzo tried to argue. We've been getting along. Harkeman cursed. Yes, I know how you've been getting along. Chicken stealing on planets like Set and Sipatotec and Melkarth. Not making enough to cover maintenance expenses. That's why your ship's in the shape she is. Well, those days are over. Both ships ought to have a full overhaul, but we'll have to skip that till we have a shipyard of our own but I will insist, at least, that your guns and launchers are in order. And your detection equipment. You didn't get a fix on the Nemesis till we were less than twenty thousand miles off planet." "'We had better get the Lamia in condition first, Trask said. We can put her on off-planet watch instead of that pair of pinnaces. Work on the Lamia started the next day and considerable friction heat was generated between her officers and the engineer sent over from the Nemesis. Baron Rathmore went aboard and came back laughing. "'You know how that ship's run?' he asked. "'There's a sort of Soviet of officers. Chief engineer, exec, guns and missiles, astrogator and so on. Spasso's just an animated ventriloquist dummy. I talk to all of them. None of them can pin me down to anything but they think we're going to heave Spazzo out of command and appoint one of them, and each one thinks he'll be it. I don't know how long that'll last. It's a string and tape job, like the one we're having to do on the ship. It'll hold till we get something better." "'We'll have to get rid of Spasso, Harkeman agreed. I think we'll put one of our own people in his place. Valkenhayn can stay in command of the space scourge. He's a spaceman but Spazzo's not good for anything." The local problem was complicated, too. The locals spoke lingua terra of a sort, like every descendant of the race that had gone out from the Sol system in the third century, but it was a barely comprehensible sort. 
On civilized planets, the language had been frozen unalterably in microbooks and voice tapes. But microbooks can only be read and sound tapes heard with the aid of electricity, and Tanith had lost that long ago. Most of the people Spasso and Valkenhayn had kidnapped and enslaved came from villages within a radius of five hundred miles. About half of them wanted to be repatriated. They were given gifts of knives, tools, blankets, and bits of metal, which seemed to be the chief standard of value and medium of exchange, and shipped home. Finding their proper villages was not easy. At each such village the news was spread that the space Vikings would hereafter pay for what they received. The Lamia was overhauled as rapidly as possible. She was still far from being a good ship, but she was much closer being one than before. She was fitted with the best detection equipment that could be assembled and put on orbit. Alvin Carford took command of her, with some of Spasso's officers, some of Alkenhain's, and a few from the Nemesis. Harkeman was intending to use her for retraining of all the Lamia and Space Scourge officers, and rotated them back and forth. The labor guards, a score in number, were relieved of their duties, issued Sword World firearms, and given intensive training. The trade tokens, stamps of colored plastic, were introduced, and a store was set up where they could be exchanged for Sword World items. After a while it dawned on the locals that the tokens could also be used for trading among themselves. Money seemed to have been one of the adjuncts of civilization that had been lost along Tanith's downward path. A few of them were able to use contragravity handlifters and hand-towed lifter skids. Several were even learning to operate things like bulldozers, at least to the extent of knowing which lever or button did what. Give them a little time, Trask thought, watching a gang at work down on the spaceport floor. It wouldn't be many years before half of them would be piloting air cars. As soon as the Lamia was on orbital watch, the space scourge was set down at the spaceport and work started on her. It was decided that Valkenhayn would take her to Graham. Enough Nemesis people would go along to ensure good faith on his part and to talk to Duke Angus and the Tanith investors. Baron Rathmore, and Patrick Morland, and several other Wardshaven gentlemen adventurers for the latter function, Alvin Carford to act as Valkenhayn's exec, with private orders to supersede him in command if necessary, and Guat Kirby to do the astrogating. "'We'll have to take the Nemesis and the Space Scourge out first, and make a big raid,' Harkeman said. "'We can't send the Space Scourge back to Graham empty.' When Baron Rathmore and Lord Valpry and the rest of them talk to Duke Angus and the Tanith investors, they'll have to have a lot more than some travel films of Tanith. They'll have to be able to show that Tanith is producing. We ought to have a little money of our own to invest, too. But Otto, both ships? That worried Trask. Suppose Dunnan comes and finds nobody here but Spasso and the Lamia. Chance we'll have to take. Personally, I think we have a year to a year and a half before Dunnan shows up here. I know, we were fooled trying to guess what he'd do before, but the sort of raid I have in mind will need two ships, and in any case, I don't want to leave both those ships here while we're gone, even if you do. When it comes to that, I don't think I do either. But we can't trust Spasso here alone, can we? We'll leave enough of our people to make sure. We'll leave Alvin. That'll mean a lot of work for me that he'd otherwise do on the ship. And Baron Rathmore, and young Valpry. And the men who've been training our sepoys. We can shuffle things around, and leave some of Alkenhain's men in place of some of Spasso's. We might even talk Spasso into going along. That'll mean having to endure him at our table, but it would be wise. Have you picked a place to raid? Three of them. First, Capera. That's only thirty light-years from here. That won't amount to much, just chicken-stealing. It'll give our green hands some relatively safe combat training, and it'll give us some idea of how Spazos and Valkenhayn's people behave, and give them confidence for the next job. And then? Amaterasu. My information about Amaterasu is about twenty years old. A lot of things can happen in twenty years. 
All I know of it, I was never there myself, is it's fairly civilized. About like Terra, just before the beginning of the Atomic Era. No nuclear energy, they lost that, and of course nothing beyond it. But they have hydroelectric and solar electric power, and non-nuclear jet aircraft. And some very good chemical explosive weapons, which they use very freely on each other. It was last known to have been raided by a ship from Excalibur twenty years ago. That sounds promising. And the third planet? Beowulf. We won't take enough damage on Amaterasu to make any difference there, but if we saved Amaterasu for last, we might be needing too many repairs. It's like that? Yes, they have nuclear energy. I don't think it would be wise to mention Beowulf to Captain Spasso and Valkenhayn. Wait till we've hit Capera and Amaterasu. They may be feeling like heroes then. 11. Capera left a bad taste in Trask's mouth. He was still tasting it when the colored turbulence died out of the screen and left the gray nothingness of hyperspace. Garvin Spasso. They had had no trouble in inducing him to come along. He was staring avidly at the screen as though he could still see the ravished planet they had left. That was a good one! That was a good one! he was crowing. He had said that a dozen times since they had lifted out. Three cities in five days, and all the stuff we gathered up around them. We took over two million stellars. And did ten times as much damage getting it, and there were no scale of values by which to compute the death and suffering. Knock it off, Spasso. You said that before. There was a time when he wouldn't have spoken to the fellow, or anybody else like that. Gresham's law extended. Bad manners drive out good manners. Spasso turned on him indignantly. Who do you think you are? He thinks he's Lord Trask of Tanith, Harkaman said. He's right, too. He is. He looked searchingly at Trask for a moment, then turned back to Spasso. I'm just as tired as he is of hearing you pop your mouth about a lousy two million stellars. Nearer a million and a half, but two million's nothing to pop about. Maybe it would be for the Lamia, but we have a three-ship fleet and a planetary base to meet expenses on. Out of this raid, a ground fighter or an able spaceman will get a hundred and fifty stellars. We'll get about a thousand ourselves. How long do you think we can stay in business doing this kind of chicken-stealing? You call this chicken-stealing? I call it chicken-stealing and so will you before we get back to Tanith, if you live that long." For a moment Spasso was still affronted. Then, temporarily, his vulpine face showed avaricious hope, and then apprehension. Evidently he knew Otto Harkeman's reputation, and some of the things Harkeman had done weren't his idea of an easy way to make money. Capera had been easy. The locals hadn't anything to fight with. Small arms and light cannon, which hadn't been able to fire more than a few rounds. Wherever they had attempted resistance, the combat cars had swooped in, dropping bombs and firing machine guns and auto cannon. Yet they had fought, bitterly and hopelessly, just as he would have, defending Traskin. Trask busied himself getting coffee and a cigarette from one of the robots. When he looked up, Spasso had gone away and Harkeman was sitting on the edge of the desk, loading his short pipe. "'Well, you saw the elephant, Lucas,' Harkeman said. "'You don't seem to have liked it.' "'Elephant? Old Terran expression I read somewhere. All I know is that an elephant was an animal about the size of one of your Graham Megatheers. The expression means experiencing something for the first time which makes a great impression. Elephants must have been something to see. This was your first Viking raid. You've seen it now." He'd been in combat before. He'd led fighting men of Traskin during the boundary dispute with Baron Manuel, and there were always bandits and cattle rustlers. He'd thought it would be like that. He remembered, five days, or was it five ages ago, his excited anticipation as the city grew and spread in the screen and the nemesis came dropping down toward it. The pinnaces, 
his four and the two from the space scourge, had gone spiraling out a hundred miles beyond the city. The space scourge had gone into a tighter circle twenty miles from its center. The nemesis had continued her relentless descent until she was ten miles from the ground, before she began spewing out landing craft and combat cars, and the little egg-shaped one-man air cavalry mounts. It had been thrilling. Everything had gone perfectly. Not even Valkenhayn's gang had goofed. Then the screen views had begun coming in. The brief and hopeless fight in the city. He could still see that silly little field gun. It must have been around seventy or eighty millimeter on a high-wheeled carriage, drawn by six shaggy, bandy-legged beasts. They had gotten it unlimbered and were trying to get it on a target when a rocket from an aircar landed directly under the muzzle. Gun, caisson, crew, even the draft team fifty yards behind, had simply vanished. Or the little company, some of them women, trying to defend the top of a tall and half-ruinous building with rifles and pistols. One air cavalryman wiped them all out with his machine-guns. They don't have a chance, he'd said, half-sick, but they keep on fighting. Yes, stupid of them, isn't it? Harkeman, beside him, had said. What would you do in their place? Fight? Try to kill as many space Vikings as I could before they got me. Terro humans are all stupid like that. That's why we're human. If the taking of the city had been a massacre, the sack that had followed had been a man-made hell. He had gone down, along with Harkeman, while the fighting, if it could be so called, was still going on. Harkeman had suggested that the men ought to see him moving about among them. For his own part, he had felt a compulsion to share their guilt. He and Sir Patrick Morland had been on foot together in one of the big hollow buildings that had stood since Capera had been a member republic of the Terran Federation. The air was acrid with smoke, powder smoke, and the smoke of burning. It was surprising how much would burn in this city of concrete and vitrified stone. It was surprising, too, how well kept everything was, at least on the ground level. These people had taken pride in their city. They found themselves alone in a great empty hallway. The noise and horror of the sack had moved away from them, or they from it, and then, when they entered a side hall, they saw a man, one of the locals, squatting on the floor with the body of a woman cradled on his lap. She was dead, half her head had been blown off, but he was clasping her tightly, her blood staining his shirt and sobbing heartbrokenly. A carbine lay forgotten on the floor beside him. "'Poor devil,' Morland said, and started forward. "'No!' Trass stopped him with his left hand. With his right, he drew his pistol and shot the man dead. Morland was horrified. "'Great Satan, Lucas! Why did you do that?' "'I wish Andre Dunnan had done that for me.' He thumbed the safety on and holstered the pistol. "'None of this would be happening if he had. How many more happinesses do you think we've smashed here today? And we don't even have Dunnan's excuse of madness.' The next morning, with everything of value collected and sent aboard, they had started cross-country for five hundred miles to another city, the first hundred over a countryside a smoke from burning villages Valkenhayn's men had pillaged the night before. There was no warning. Capera had lost electricity and radio and telegraph, and the spread of news was at the speed of one of the beasts the locals insisted on calling horses. By mid-afternoon they had finished with that city. It had been as bad as the first one. One thing, it was the center of a considerable cattle country. The cattle were native to the planet, heavy-bodied unicorns the size of a gram bisonoid, or one of the slightly mutated Terran carabaos on Tanith, with long hair like a Terran yak. He had detailed a dozen of the nemesis ground-fighters, who had been vaqueros on his Traskan ranches, to collect a score of cows and four likely bulls, with enough fodder to last them on the voyage. The odds were strongly against any of them living to a climate themselves to Tanith, 
but if they did, they might prove to be one of the most valuable pieces of loot from Capera. The third city was at the forks of a river, like Trade Town on Tanith. Unlike it, it was a real metropolis. They should have gone there first of all. They spent two days systematically pillaging it. The Caparans carried on considerable river traffic, with stern-wheel steamboats, and the waterfront was lined with warehouses crammed with every sort of merchandise. Even better, the Caparans had money, and for the most part it was gold specie, and the bank vaults were full of it. Unfortunately, the city had been built since the fall of the Federation, and the climb up from the barbarism that had followed, and a great deal of it was wood. Fire started almost at once, and it was almost completely on fire by the end of the second day. It had been visible in the telescopic screen even after they were out of atmosphere. A black smear until the turning planet carried it into darkness and then a lurid glow. It was a filthy business. Harkeman nodded. Robbery and murder always are. You didn't have to ask me who said that space Vikings are professional robbers and murderers, but who was it said that he didn't care how many planets were raided and how many innocents massacred in the old Federation? A dead man, Lucas Trask of Traskin. You wish now that you'd kept Traskin and stayed on Graham? No, if I had, I'd have spent every hour wishing I was doing what I'm doing now. I can get used to this, I suppose. I think you will. At least you kept your rations down. I didn't on my first raid, and had bad dreams about it for a year." He gave his coffee cup back to the robot and got to his feet. Get a little rest for a couple of hours, then draw some alkadote vitamin pills from the medic. As soon as things are secured, there'll be parties all over the ship and we'll be expected to look in on every one of them, have a drink, and say, Well done, boys. Elaine came to him while he was resting. She looked at him in horror, and he tried to hide his face from her, and then he realized that he was trying to hide it from himself. 12. They came straight down on Eglinsby on Amaterasu, the nemesis and space scourge side by side. The radar had picked them up at point five light seconds. By this time the whole planet knew they were coming, and nobody was wondering why. Paul Koreff was monitoring at least twenty radio stations, assigning somebody to each one as it was identified. What was coming in was uniformly excited, some panicky, and all in fairly standard lingua terra. Garvin Spasso was perturbed. So, in the communication screen from the space scourge, was Boke Valkenhayn. They got radio, and they got radar, he clamored. Well, so what? Harkeman asked. They had radio and radar twenty years ago, when Rock Morgan was here in the coal sack. But they don't have nuclear energy, do they? Well, no. I'm picking up a lot of industrial electrical discharge, but nothing nuclear. All right. A man with a club can lick a man with his fists, a man with a gun can lick half a dozen with clubs, and two ships with nuclear weapons can lick a whole planet without them. Think it's time, Lucas?" He nodded. Paul, can you cut in on that Eglinsby station yet? What are you going to do? Valken Hain wanted to know, against it in advance. Summon them to surrender. If they don't, we will drop a hell-burner and then we will pick out another city and summon it to surrender. I don't think the second one will refuse. If we are going to be murderers, we'll do it right this time." Valkenhayn was aghast, probably at the idea of burning an unlooted city. Spasso was sputtering something about, "'Teach the dirty neobarbs a lesson!' Korov told him he was switched on. He picked up a handphone. Space Vikings, Nemesis and Space Scourge, calling the city of Eglinsby. Space Vikings. He repeated it for over a minute. There was no reply. Van, he called guns and missiles. A subcrit display job, about four miles over the city. He laid the phone down and looked to the underside viewscreen. 
A little later, a silvery shape dropped away from the ship's south pole. The telescopic screen went off, and the unmagnified screen darkened as the filters went on. Valkenhayn, aboard the other ship, was shouting a warning about his own screens. The only unfiltered screen aboard the Nemesis was the one tuned to the falling missile. The city of Eglinsby rushed upward in it, and then it went suddenly dark. There was an orange-yellow blaze in the other screens. After a while, the filters went off and the telescopic screen went on again. He picked up the phone. Space Vikings calling Eglinsby. This is your last warning. Communicate at once. Less than a minute later, a voice came out of one of the speakers. Eglinsby calling Space Vikings. Your bomb has done great damage. Will you hold your fire until somebody in authority can communicate with you? This is the chief operator at the Central State Telecast Station. I have no authority to say anything to you, or discuss anything." "'Oh, good. That sounds like a dictatorship,' Harkiman was saying. "'Grab the dictator and shove a pistol in his face, and you have everything.' "'There is nothing to discuss. Get somebody who has authority to surrender the city to us. If this is not done within the hour, the city and everybody in it will be obliterated." Only minutes later a new voice said, "'This is Gonzales Jan, secretary to Pedrosan Pedro, president of the Council of Syndics. We will switch President Pedrosan over as soon as we can speak directly to the personage in supreme command of your ships. That is myself. Switch him to me at once. After a delay of less than fifteen seconds, they had President Pedrosan Pedro. We are prepared to resist, but we realize what this would cost in lives and destruction of property, he began. You don't begin to. Do you know anything about nuclear weapons? From history, we have no nuclear power of any sort. We can find no fissionables on this planet. The cost, as you put it, would be everything and everybody in Eglinsby and for a radius of almost a hundred miles. Are you still prepared to resist?" The President of the Council of Syndics wasn't, and said so. Trask asked him how much authority his position gave him. "'I have all powers in any emergency. I think,' the voice added tonelessly, "'that this is an emergency. The Council will automatically ratify any decision I make." Harkiman depressed a button in front of him. What I said, dictatorship, with parliamentary false front. If he isn't a false front dictator for some oligarchy, he motioned to Harkiman to take his thumb off the button. How large is this Council? Sixteen, elected by the syndicates they represent. There is the Syndicate of Labor, the Syndicate of Manufacturers, the Syndicate of Small Businesses, the Corporate State, First Century Pre-Atomic on Terra. Benny the Moose, Harkiman said. Let's all go down and talk to them. When they were sure that the public had been warned to make no resistance, the nemesis went down to two miles, bulking over the center of the city. The buildings were low by the standards of a contragravity-using people the highest barely a thousand feet, and few over five hundred, and they were more closely set than sword-worlders were accustomed to, with broad roadways between. In several places there were queer arrangements of crossed roadways, apparently leading nowhere. Harkiman laughed when he saw them. Airstrips! I've seen them on other planets where they've lost contragravity. For winged aircraft, powered by chemical fuel. I hope we have time for me to look around here. I'll bet they even have railroads here." The great damage caused by the bomb was about equal to the effect of a medium hurricane. He had seen worse from high winds at Traskin. Mostly it had been moral, which had been the kind intended. They met President Pedrosan and the Council of Syndics in a spacious and well-furnished chamber near the top of one of the medium-high buildings. Valkenhayn was surprised. In a loud aside, he considered that these people must be almost civilized. They were introduced. Amaterasuan surnames preceded personal names, 
which hinted at a culture and a political organization making much use of registration by alphabetical list. They all wore garments which had the indefinable but unmistakable appearance of uniforms. When they had all seated themselves at a large oval table, Harkeman drew his pistol and used the butt for a gavel. "'Lord Trask, will you deal with these people directly?' he asked, stiffly formal. "'Certainly, Admiral,' he spoke to the President, ignoring the others. "'We wanted understood that we control this city, and we expect complete submission. As long as you remain submissive to us, we will do no damage beyond removal of the things we wish to take from it, and there will be no violence to any of your people, or any indiscriminate vandalism. The visit we are paying you will cost you heavily, make no mistake about that, but whatever the cost, it will be a cheap price for avoiding what we might otherwise do." The President and the Syndics exchanged relieved glances. Let the taxpayers worry about the cost. They'd come out of it with whole skins. "'You understand, we want maximum value and minimum bulk,' he continued. "'Jewels, objects of art, furs, the better grades of luxury goods of all kinds, rare element metals, and monetary metals, gold and platinum. You have metallic-based currency, I suppose?' "'Oh, no!' President Pedrosen was slightly scandalized. Our currency is based on services to society. Our monetary unit is simply called a credit." Harkeman snorted impolitely. Evidently, he'd seen economic systems like that before. Trask wanted to know if they used gold or platinum at all. Gold, to some extent, for jewelry. Evidently, they weren't complete economic Puritans. And platinum in industry, of course. If they want gold, they should have raided Stalgoland," one of the syndics said. They have a gold standard currency. From the way he said it, he might have been accusing them of eating with their fingers, and possibly of eating their own young. I know. The maps we are using for this planet are a few centuries old. Stalgoland doesn't seem to appear on them. I wish it didn't appear on ours, either. That was General de Gros Hector. Syndic for State Protection. "'It would have been a good thing for this whole planet if you decided to raid them instead of us,' somebody else said. "'It isn't too late for these gentlemen to make that decision,' Pedrosen said. "'I gather that gold is a monetary metal among your people?' When Trask nodded, he continued. "'It is also the basis of the Stalgonian currency. The actual currency is paper, theoretically redeemable in gold. In actuality, the circulation of gold has been prohibited, and the entire gold wealth of the nation is concentrated in vaults at three depositories. We know exactly where they are." "'You begin to interest me, President Pedrosen.' "'I do. Well, you have two large spaceships and six smaller craft. You have nuclear weapons, something nobody on this planet has. You have contragravity something that is hardly more than a legend here. On the other hand, we have a million and a half ground troops, jet aircraft, armored ground vehicles, and chemical weapons. If you will undertake to attack Stalgoland, we will place this entire force at your disposal. General Dragro will command them as you direct. All that we ask is that, when you have loaded the gold hordes of Stalgoland aboard your ships, you will leave our troops in possession of the country. That was all there was to that meeting. There was a second one. Only Trask, Harkeman, and Sir Patrick Morland represented the Space Vikings, and the Eglinsby government was represented by President Pedrosen and General Dagro. They met more intimately, in a smaller and more luxurious room in the same building. "'If you're going to declare war on Stalgoland, you'd better get along with it,' Morland advised. "'What?' Pedrosen seemed to have only the vaguest idea of what he was talking about. "'You mean, warn them? Certainly not. We will attack them by surprise. It will be nothing but plain self-defense,' he added righteously. "'The oligarchic capitalists of Stogoland have been plotting to attack us for years.' "'Yes, if you had carried out your original intention of looting Eglinsby, 
they would have invaded us the moment your ships lifted out. It's exactly what I do in their place." "'But you maintain nominally friendly relations with them?' "'Of course. We are civilized. The peace-loving government and people of Eglinsby—' "'Yes, Mr. President, I understand. And they have an embassy here?' "'They call it that,' cried Degro. "'It is a nest of vipers, a plague-spot of espionage and subversion.' We'll grab that ourselves right away," Harkeman said. You won't be able to round up all their agents outside it, and if we tried to, it would cause suspicion. We will have to put up a front to deceive them. Yes, you will go on the air at once, calling on the people to collaborate with us, and you will specifically order your troops mobilized to assist us in collecting the tribute we are levying on Eglinsby," Trask said. In that way, if any Stalgonian spies see your troops concentrated around our landing craft, they'll think it's to help us load our loot, and we'll announce that a large part of the tribute will consist of military equipment," Dagro added. That will explain why our guns and tanks are being loaded on your contragravity vehicles. When the Stalgonian embassy was seized by the Space Vikings, the ambassador asked to be taken at once to their leader. He had a proposition. If the Space Vikings would completely disable the army of Eglinsby and admit Stalgonian troops when they were ready to leave, the invaders would bring with them ten thousand kilos of gold. Trask affected to be very hospitable to the offer. Stalgoland lay across a narrow and shallow sea from the state of Eglinsby. It was dotted with islands, and every one of them was, in turn, dotted with oil wells. Petroleum was what kept the aircraft and ground vehicles of Amaterasu in operation. Oil, rather than ideology, was at the root of the enmity between the two nations. Apparently the Stalgonian espionage in Eglinsby was completely deceived, and the reports Trask allowed the captive ambassador to make confirmed the deception. Hourly the Eglinsby radio stations poured out exhortations to the people to cooperate with the Space Vikings, with an occasional lamentation about the masses of war materials being taken. Eglinsby espionage in Stalgaland was similarly active. The Stalgonian armies were being massed at four seaports on the coast facing Eglinsby, and there was a frantic gathering of every sort of ship available. By this time, any sympathy that Trask might have felt for either party had evaporated. The invasion of Stogaland started the fifth morning after their arrival over Eglinsby. Before dawn, the six pinnaces went in, making a wide sweep around the curvature of the planet and coming in from the north, two to each of the three gold troves. They were detected by radar eventually, but too late for any effective resistance to be organized. Two were even taken without a shot. By mid-morning all three had been blown open and the ingots and specie were being removed. The four seaports from whence the Stalgonian invasion of Eglinsby was to have been launched were neutralized by nuclear bombing. Neutralized was a nice word, Trask thought. There was no echo in it of the screams of the still living, maimed and burned and blinded, around the fringes of Ground Zero. The Nemesis and the Space Scourge, from landing craft and from the ships themselves, landed Eglinsby troops on Stalgonopolis. While they were sacking the city, with all the usual atrocities, the Space Vikings were loading the gold, and anything else that was of more than ordinary value aboard the ships. They were still at it the next morning, when President Pedrosen arrived at the newly conquered capital announcing his intention of putting the Stalgonian chief of state and his cabinet on trial as war criminals. Before sunset they were back over Eglinsby. The loot might run as high as a half-billion Excalibur Stellars. Bulk Valkenhayn and Garvin Spasso were simply beyond astonishment and beyond words. The looting of Eglinsby then began. They gathered up machinery and stocks of steel and light metal alloys. The city was full of warehouses, and the warehouses were crammed with valuables. In spite of the socialistic and egalitarian verbiage behind which the government operated, 
there seemed to be a numerous elite class, and if gold were not a monetary metal it was not despised for purposes of ostentation. There were several large art museums. Van Larch, their nearest approach to an art specialist, took charge of culling the best from them. And there was a vast public library. Into this Otto Harkeman vanished, with half a dozen men and a contragravity scow. Its historical section would be much poorer in the future. President Pedro San Pedro was on the radio from Stalganopolis that night. "'Is this how you space Vikings keep faith?' he demanded indignantly. "'You've abandoned me and my army here in Stalgaland, and you're sacking Eglinsby. You promised to leave Eglinsby alone if I helped you get the gold of Stalgaland. I promised nothing of the kind. I promised to help you take Stalgaland. You've taken it, Trask told him. I promised to avoid unnecessary damage or violence. I've already hanged a dozen of my own men for rape, murder, and wanton vandalism. Now we expect to be out of here in twenty-four hours. You'd better be back here before then. Your own people are starting to loot. We did not promise to control them for you. That was true. What few troops had been left behind, and the police, were unable to cope with the mobs that were pillaging in the wake of the Space Vikings. Everybody seemed to be trying to grab what he could and let the Vikings be blamed for it. He had been able to keep his own people in order. There had been at least a dozen cases of rape and wanton murder, and the offenders had been promptly hanged. None of their shipmates, not even the Space Scourge Company, seemed resentful. They felt the culprits had deserved what they'd gotten. Not for what they'd done to the locals, but for disobeying orders. A few troops had been flown in from Stogoland by the time they had gotten their vehicles stowed and were lifting out. They didn't seem to be making much headway. Harkeman, who had gotten his load of microbooks stowed and was at the command desk, laughed heartily. I don't know what Pedrosin'll do. Gehenna, I don't even know what I'd do if I'd gotten myself into a mess like that. He'll probably bring half his army back, leave the other half in Stalgaland, and lose both. Suppose we drop in, in about three or four years, just out of curiosity. If we make twenty per cent of what we did this time, the trip would pay for itself." After they went into hyperspace and had the ship secured, the parties lasted three galactic standard days, and nobody was at all sober. Harkeman was drooling over the mass of historical material he had found. Spasso was jubilant. Nobody could call this chicken-stealing. He kept repeating that as long as he was able to say anything. Capera, he conceded, had been. Lousy two or three million stellars. Pooh! End of chapter 12